Well, welcome everybody. Crouching Python here with the very first, very first in what I think might be a long and fruitful relationship of reading. Um, I was going to call this Reading Revolution, but then I looked at it as I wrote it and I read Reading Revelation and I thought, you know, I like that better. So we're going to go with that. Anyway, I've been thinking about all of my students and students all over the world who have been stuck in quarantine and life is a little weird. And my wife, who has all the greatest ideas, said to me, you should read to your students. You used to read to your students. And it's true, I did a long, long time ago. And as with all ideas, hers are always the best. So I'm going to go with that. And I picked a book that I love and I read it to my students a long time ago and they loved it then so this is we're gonna try it anyway this is the book of three the book of three by Lloyd Alexander which is the very first in a tetralogy that's a big word tetralogy is a five book series and you might be thinking at the outset oh I, five are you kidding but I think once you get hooked, you're going to wish that it was longer. So anyway, we're going to try it. Let's see how it works. And I'll throw it up there on YouTube and uh, hope that all things work out. I need to get a drink of water here first before I start reading. <clears throat> okay, you ready? So this is the Book of Three by Lloyd Alexander, Chapter One, which is called The Assistant Pig Keeper. Taran wanted to make a sword, but Kahl, charged with the practical side of his education, decided on horseshoes. And so it had been horseshoes all morning long. Taran's arms ached, soot blackened his face. At last he dropped the hammer and turned to Kahl, who was watching him critically. Why? Taran cried. Why must it be horseshoes? As if we had any horses! Call was stout and round, and his great bald head glowed bright pink. Lucky for the horses, was all he said, glancing at Taryn's handiwork. I could do better at making a sword, Taryn protested. I know I could. And before Call could answer, he snatched the tongs, flung a strip of red-hot iron to the anvil, and began hammering away as fast as he could. Wait, wait, cried Call. That is not the way to go after it. Heedless of Call, unable to even hear him above the din, Taran pounded harder than ever. Sparks sprayed the air. But the more he pounded, the more the metal twisted and buckled, until finally the iron sprang from the tongs and fell to the ground. Taran stayed, stared in dismay. With the tongs, he picked up the bent iron and examined it. Not quite the blade for a hero. Call remarked. It's ruined, Taran glumly agreed. It looks like a sick snake, he added ruefully. As I tried telling you, said Call, you had it all wrong. You must hold the tongs so. When you strike, the strength must flow from your shoulder and your wrist be loose. You can hear it when you do it right. There is a kind of music in it. Besides, he added, this is not the metal. For weapons. Call returned the crooked, half-formed blade to the surface, where it lost its shape entirely. I wish I might have my own sword, Taran sighed. And you would teach me sword fighting. Wished, cried Call. Why should you want to know that? We have no battles here at Kaer Dalben. We have no horses either, objected Taran. But we're making horseshoes. Get on with you, said Call, unmoved. This is for practice. And so would this be, Taran urged. Come, teach me the art of sword fighting. You must know the art. Call's shining head glowed even brighter. A trace of a smile appeared on his face, as though he were savoring something pleasant. True, he said quietly. I have held a sword once or twice in my day. Teach me now, pleaded Taran. He seized a poker and brandished it, slashing at the air and dancing back and forth over the hard-packed earthen floor. 
See, he called, I know most of it already. Hold your hand, chuckled Call. If you were to come against me like that, with all your posing and bouncing, I should have chopped you into bits by this time. He hesitated a moment. Look you, he said quickly. At least you should know there is a right way and a wrong way to go about it. He picked up another poker. Here now, he ordered with a sooty wink, stand like a man. Taran brought up his poker. While Call shouted instructions, they set to parrying and thrusting, with much banging, clanging, and commotion. For a moment, Taran was sure he had the better of Call, but the old man spun away with amazing lightness of foot. Now it was Taran who strove desperately to ward off Call's blows. Abruptly, Call stopped. So did Taran, his poker poised in midair. In the doorway of the forge, stood the tall, bent figure of Dalben. Dalben, master of care Dalben, was 379 years old. His beard covered so much of his face he seemed always to be peering over a gray cloud. On the little farm, while Taran and Call saw to the plowing, sowing, weeding, reaping, and all the other tasks of husbandry, Dalben undertook the meditating an occupation so exhausting he could accomplish it only by lying down and closing his eyes. He meditated an hour and a half following breakfast and again later in the day. The clatter from the forge had roused him from his morning meditation. His robe hung askew over his bony knees. Stop that nonsense directly, said Dalbin. I am surprised at you, he added, frowning at Call. There is serious work to be done. It wasn't call, Taran interrupted. It was I who asked to learn sword play. I did not say I was surprised at you, remarked Dalbin, but perhaps I am after all. I think you had best come with me. Taran followed the ancient man out of the forge, across the chicken run, and into the white thatched cottage. There, in Dalbin's chamber, moldering tomes overflowed the sagging shelves and spilled onto the floor amid heaps of iron cookpots, studded belts, harps with or without strings, and other oddments. Taran took his place on the wooden bench, as he always did when Dalbin was in a mood for giving lessons or reprimands. I fully understand, said Dalbin, setting himself behind his table. In the use of weapons, as in everything else, there is a certain skill. But wiser heads than yours will, will determine when you should learn it. I'm sorry, Taran began. I should not have, Dalbin said. I'm not angry. Only a little sad. Time flies quickly. Things always happen sooner than one expects. And yet, he murmured, almost to himself, it troubles me. I fear the Horned King may have some part in this. The Horned King? asked Taran. We shall speak of him later, said Dalbin. He drew a ponderous, leather-bound volume toward him. The Book of Three, from which he occasionally read to Taran, and which, the boy believed, held in its pages everything anyone could possibly want to know. As I have I have explained to you before, Dalbin went on, and you have very likely forgotten. Prydain is a land of many cantrevs, of small kingdoms, and many kings. And of course, there are war leaders who command the warriors. But there is the high king above them all, said Taran, Math, son of Mathanwi. His war leader is the mightiest hero in Prydain. You told me of him, Prince Gwydion. Yes, Taran went on eagerly. I know there are other things you do not know, Dalbin said, for the obvious reason that I have not told you. For the moment, I am less concerned with the realms of the living than with the land of the dead, with Anuven. Taran shuddered at the word. Even Dalbin had spoken it in a whisper. And with King Aaron, Lord of Anuven, Dalbin said, Know this, he continued quickly, Anuvin is more than a land of death. 
It is a treasure house, not only of gold and jewels, but of all things of advantage to men. Long ago, the race of men crafted and owned these treasures. By craft and deceit, Aaron stole them one by one for his own evil uses. Some few of the treasures have been wrested from him, though most lie hidden deep in Anuvan, where Aaron guards them jealously. But Aaron did not become ruler of Prydain, Taran said. You may be thankful he did not, said Dalbin. He would have ruled had it not been for the children of Don, the sons of the Lady Don, and her consort Belin, king of the sun. Long ago they voyaged to Prydain from the summer country and found the land rich and fair, though the race of men had little for themselves. The sons of Don built their stronghold at Caer Dathil, far north in the Eagle Mountains. From there they helped regain at least a portion of what Aaron had stolen and stood as guardians against the lurking threat of Anuvan. I hate to think what would have happened if the sons of Don hadn't come, Terran said. It was a good destiny that brought them. I'm not always sure, said Dalbin, with a wry smile. The men of Prydain came to rely on the strength of the house of Don as a child clings to its mother. They do so even today. Math, the high king, is descended from the house of Don. So is Prince Gwydion. But that is all by the way. Prydain has been at peace, as much as men can be peaceful, until now. What you do not know, Dalbin said, is this. It has reached my ears that a new and mighty warlord has risen, as powerful as Gwydion. Some say more powerful, but he is a man of evil for whom death is a black joy. He sports with death as you might sport with a dog. Who is he? cried Terran. Dalbin shook his head. No man knows his name, nor has any man seen his face. He wears an antlered mask, and for this reason he is called the Horned King. His purposes I do not know. I suspect the hand of Aaron, but in what manner I cannot tell. I tell you now for your own protection. From what I saw this morning, your head is full of nonsense about feats of arms. Whatever notions you may have, I advise you to forget them immediately. There is unknown danger abroad. You are barely on the threshold of manhood, and I have a certain responsibility to see that you reach it, preferably with a whole skin. So you are not to leave Care Dalbin under any circumstances not even past the orchard, and certainly not into the forest, not for the time being. For the time being, Taran burst out. I think it will always be for the time being, and it will be vegetables and horseshoes all my life. Tut, said Dalbin, there are worse things. Do you believe it is all flashing swords and galloping about on horses? Do you set yourself to be a glorious hero? As for being glorious, what of Prince Gwydion, cried Terran. Yes, I wish I might be like him. I fear, Dalbin said, that is entirely out of the question. But why, Terran sprang to his feet. I know if I had the chance. Why, Dalbin interrupted. In some cases, he said, we learn more by looking for the answer to a question and not finding it than we do from learning the answer itself. This is one of those cases. I could tell you why, but at the moment it would only be more confusing. If you grow up with any kind of sense, which you sometimes make me doubt, you will very likely reach your own conclusions. They will probably be wrong, he added. However, since they will be yours, you will feel a little more satisfied with them. Terence sank back and sat, gloomy and silent, on the bench. Dalbin had already begun meditating again. His chin gradually came to rest on his collarbone. His beard floated around his ears like a fog bank, and he began snoring peacefully. The spring scent of apple blossom drifted through the open window. 
Beyond Dalbin's chamber, Taryn glimpsed the pale green fringe of forest. The fields ready to cultivate would soon turn golden with summer. The Book of Three lay closed on the table. Taryn had never been allowed to read the volume for himself. Now he was sure it held more than Dalbin chose to tell him. In the sun-filled room, with Dalbin still meditating and showing no sign of stopping, Taryn rose and moved through the shimmering beams. From the forest came the monotonous tick of a beetle. His hands reached for the cover. Taryn gasped in pain and snatched them away. They smarted as if each of his fingers had been stung by hornets. He jumped back, stumbled against the bench, and dropped to the floor where he put his fingers woefully into his mouth. Dalbin's eyes blinked open. He peered at Taryn and yawned slowly. You had better see Call about a lotion for those hands, he advised. Otherwise, I shouldn't be surprised if they blistered. Fingers smarting, the shame-faced Taryn hurried from the cottage and found Call near the vegetable garden. You've been at the Book of Three, Call said. That's not a hard guess. Now you know better. Well, that is one of the three foundations of learning. See much, study much, suffer much. He led Taryn to the stable where medicines for the livestock were kept and poured a concoction over Taryn's fingers. What is the use of studying much when I'm to see nothing at all, Taryn retorted. I think there's a destiny laid upon me that I'm not to know anything interesting or do anything interesting. I'm certainly not to be anything. I'm not anything even at Care Dalbin. Very well, said Call. If that is all that troubles you, I shall make you something. From this moment, you are Taryn, assistant pig keeper. You shall help me take care of Hen Wen, see her trough is full, carry her water, and give her a good scrubbing every other day. That's what I do now, Taryn said bitterly. All the better, said Call, for it makes things that much easier. If you want to be something with a name attached to it, I can't think of anything closer to hand. And it is not every lad who can be assistant keeper to an oracular pig. Got to stop for a minute. That's a big word. Oracular? Oracle? It means the pig can tell the future. Indeed, she is the only oracular pig in Prydain, and the most valuable. Valuable to Dalbin, Taryn said. She never tells me anything. Did you think she would, replied Call? With Hen Wen, you must know how to ask. Here, what was that? Call shaded his eyes with his hand. A black buzzing cloud streaked from the orchard and bore on so rapidly and passed so close to Call's head that he had to leap out of the way. The bees, Taryn shouted. They're swarming. It's not their time, cried Call. There's something amiss. The cloud rose high toward the sun. An instant later, Taryn heard a loud clucking and squawking from the chicken run. He turned to see the five hens and the rooster beating their wings. Before it occurred to him they were attempting to fly, they, too, were aloft. Taryn and Call raced to the chicken run, too late to catch the fowls. With the rooster leading, the chickens flapped awkwardly through the air and disappeared over the brow of a hill. From the stable, the pair of oxen bellowed and rolled their eyes in terror. Dalbin's head poked out of the window. He looked irritated. It has become absolutely impossible for any kind of meditation whatsoever, he said, with a severe glance at Taryn. I have warned you once. Something frightened the animals, Taryn protested. First the bees, then the chickens flew off. Dalbin's face turned grave. I have been given no knowledge of this, he said to Call. We must ask Hen Wen about it immediately, and we shall need the letter sticks. Quickly, help me find them. Call moved hastily to the cottage door. Watch Hen Wen closely, he ordered Taryn. Do not let her out of your sight. Call disappeared inside the cottage to search for Hen Wen's letter sticks. 
the long rods of ash wood carved with spells. Dalbin, he knew, would consult Henwen only on a matter of greatest urgency. Within Taran's memory, it had never happened before. He hurried to the pen. Henwen usually slept until noon. Then, trotting daintily, despite her size, she would move to a shady corner of her enclosure and settle comfortably for the rest of the day. The white pig was continually grunting and chuckling to herself, and whenever she saw Taran, she would raise her wide, cheeky face so that he could scratch under her chin. But this time she paid no attention to him. Wheezing and whistling, Henwin was digging furiously in the soft earth at the far side of the pen, burrowing so rapidly she would soon be out. Taran shouted at her, but the clods continued flying at a great rate. He swung himself over the fence. The oracular pig stopped and glanced around. As Taran approached the hole, already sizable, Henwen hurried to the opposite side of the pen and started a new excavation. Taran was strong and long-legged, but to his dismay he saw that Henwen moved faster than he. As soon as he chased her from the second hole, she turned quickly on her short legs and made for the first. Both by now were big enough for her head and shoulders. Taryn frantically began scraping earth back into the burrow. Henwen dug faster than a badger, her hind legs planted firmly, her front legs plowing ahead. Taryn despaired of stopping her. He scrambled back over the rails and jumped to the spot where Henwen was about to emerge, planning to seize her and hang on until Dalbin and Call arrived. He underestimated Henwen's speed and strength. In an explosion of dirt and pebbles, the pig burst from under the fence, heaving Taran into the air. He landed with the wind knocked out of him. Henwen raced across the field and into the woods. Taran followed. Ahead, the forest rose up dark and threatening. He took a breath and plunged after her. End of chapter one of the Book of Three. Stay tuned for chapter two, which is called The Mask of the King. Crouching Python here with the Book of Three in Reading Revelation. See you next time.